right. Uh, so I'm going to speak about Cashel and, and Munster, which is a site I suppose I've been working on for quite a long time and still haven't really figured out. Um, it's the, the capital of the kingdom of, of, of Munster. And from around about the late 7th century, its kings thought of themselves as kings of Ireland and challenged for that on the, the national scale. So it's quite a, an important site. It's also very different from the other kind of equivalent sites that we have in Ireland. So Munster is one of supposedly five provinces. So there's, these are the major overkingships in Ireland, with um, the king of Ireland supposedly a king over all of these, these, these provinces. So not really anything realised in reality till around about the 10th century AD. The capitals of these other provinces all tend to be prehistoric ceremonial centres, so places of cult and, and perhaps rulership in the Iron Age up to the late Iron Age, 4th, 5th century AD, that then become in from around about the end of the, the, the 8th century, start of the 9th century, they start to be referred to as, as royal centres, the capitals of these, these provinces. The main point to, to point out about this is that these places are very, very different. These are prehistoric complexes that have some evidence of medieval activity. And Cashel, as soon as you look at it, is very different. It's a large rock outcrop, much more akin to the sites that Gordon was talking about in Scotland. And it's occupied by a whole host of late medieval buildings, which none of these are, are early medieval. These are all kind of 1100 and, and later up to the 15th and 16th, 16th centuries. But so straight away that means that the types of authority that we might look to see manufactured and negotiated at Cashel are going to be quite different from the types of authority that we would see at uh, the, those other prehistoric provincial centres in Ireland um, and the sort of institution of sacral kingship that people like Conor Newman and others have started to develop ideas for and explore in recent, in recent centuries. And in terms of understanding the position of Cashel and its development, Key to it is understanding its role in the politics of developing an overkingship of Munster and indeed uh, a control of, uh, of that polity through the period and the aspirations of kings of Cashel to be kings of, of Ireland on the, the, the national scale. So this is a kind of a, a very conjectural but general model for how I would see the main polities develop in, in Munster through the kind of 500 to 700, 800 AD period. The key point is that the, the, the kings that control Cashel and the people we can associate with it, they, they control different territories through the 5th, 6th and 7th centuries and they more or less expanded their control as they, they could throughout the province and that's the point at which they, they started to look north and try and control the, the island. The major thing to say though is that even within that, if we can see regional kingdoms within an over kingdom of Munster, there's probably about 90 if not more localised kingdoms on a very small scale, the kind of Rituha that, that Nick was, was talking about, of very small territories that ma maintain some semblance of autonomy right into the 10th, 11th and 12th centuries. And that's the big difficulty with studying in Ireland, is trying to see how that um, regional scale of over kingship on the one hand operates when it's underpinned by very localised and seemingly autonomous scales of, 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 of localised kingship. So the kings that are associated with Cashel are called the, the, the Oganacta, but in reality the Oganacta is this confederacy of dynasties that are spread throughout the province that aren't in any way related, but were actually competing uh, groups against each other for control of the wider region and the, 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 the wider kind of southern sphere of Ireland through much of the, of the period. And around about the period 670 to 700, they um, coalesce together into a confederacy that subsumes the previously two powerful ones, the Kirkaligda and the Ivechlera. And essentially, the, these two main groups gave rise to a whole host of different dynasties scattered throughout the province that controlled the majority of the, the territory. So if that's kind of the historical, historical background, in terms of archaeology, Cashel is very different to these other centres in, in, in Ireland, and it's always posed a problem because of that. It doesn't really have a prehistoric archaeology, and for the last 10 years or so, people, or 20, 20 years or so, people have kind of assumed that once we start survey and excavation, we'll actually start to find that prehistoric element, that it must be there because that's what Irish kingship looks like. But it's not really. After a whole host of geophysics and looking at LIDAR surveys, there's not much prehistoric evidence from it. There's a, there's a, a limited amount of artefacts from, say, the 1st to 5th, 6th centuries AD, from either on the rock itself or from the, the immediate hinterland. This is the only object that predates about 500 from the rock itself. It's a fibula that was found in 19th century rubble, um, uh, it, sorry, in rubble in the, the late 19th century. And even in road schemes for developer-led projects around Cashel, there seems to be a gap between around about the first century AD and the second half of the fifth century at the earliest. So there seems to be 
good, relatively good evidence that from around about the 5th or 6th centuries, that's when cattle really starts to become important. Another kind of tangible aspect to this is that Cashel is one of the few places of power and, and royal power in 5th to 10th century Ireland where we have very little evidence for concrete evidence for churches within the landscape surrounding it. So there's actually no certain church site within the, the, what, we might, what we might think of as the, the royal domain or the, the, the core royal landscape around Cashel. There are some place names and sites that might be associated with churches, but none of these are secure, have evidence um, for kind of ecclesiastical archaeology or even attested ecclesiastical functions before maybe the 13th or 14th centuries. We do, however, have churches out around the royal domain, places like Kilmore, Clunfinglas, Turin and Uri, which we know were patronised and founded by kings of Cashel in the 6th and 7th centuries AD. So they, they weren't non-Christian by any means, but for some reason the landscape of Cashel is different. And that might be to, to do with the fact that Cashel its very name means a fortress, a fortified place. It's derived from the Latin castellum. So it seems to be a site that is in some way defended or intended to be defended from its very inception. Now, it changes in how, it's, how it functions. Identifying the archaeological component of that defended element or the, the bit that's inherent in the name Cashel itself is inordinately difficult because Cashel remains a site of activity right to the present day. So there is a late or there is a town that developed in the late medieval period and the rock itself became an archiepiscopal an archiepiscopal see in 1101 when it was granted to the, to the church. So that means that all the beautiful buildings that crown the rock itself were probably constructed from materials quarried from the, the, the outcrop or the crag of the, the rock itself. So when you go around looking for any archaeological evidence, any hints of it seem to be quarried to bits, or they might just be the results of quarrying themselves. So for instance, we have large sections of ditch that uh, seem to perhaps create terraces on the northern faces, where we have large orthostatic blocks that might be placed at the top of these, these terraces. These could be defensive, or they could just be large pieces of limestone that were quarried in the 19th century, even in the late medieval period, to build the cathedral. Until we maybe see about sticking some, some trenches into it, we won't know for, for, for certain. There is, however, definite attempts to, to heighten the, the, the natural terracing of the, the northern face. So we can see a rubble wall here that stands on top of a, a kind of a four metre high um, wall face, so it's a bit superfluous unless you're trying to heighten the impressiveness of the, the wall face on the north. So possibly there's evidence, or at least a kind of a, a smoking gun, that there's some attempt at, at fortifying the rock in the, the early medieval period. On the northeastern corner, there's a very large rock cut gorge, again, possibly from quarrying in the last min or the, the, the recent thousand years. Or at any point, really, we, we don't know. But it could also be some form of entrance way because it gives access to the very um, top north northeastern corner inside the present summit enclosure where we have this ditched feature that looks like it could possibly be a ditch around the summit of the, the knoll. And then on the northeastern corner too, we have these banks that we can see in aerial photographs that seem to suggest two phases of activity here that might again be evidence for enclosures or activities on the rock. On the western faces, no matter what we do, photogrammetry, uh, LIDAR data, it's really, really badly quarried. But again, there's a hint of terracing, there's a hint of some banks and ditches possible enclosures that might be related um, to fortifications or, or that kind of pr primary phase of activity, but really, really difficult to, to say. That picture is, is complicated then by geophysics and some very recent excavation where, so there's been about, about 30 hectares of different methods of geophysics done around the rock. So quite a substantial area. The thing that's missing is prehistoric archaeology. There's none really there as far as we can see, but there is lots and lots of evidence that we don't know what date it is. So some of the really interesting features that came up is this large kind of L-shaped enclosure, which has a barrow at the center of it, and possibly some form of feature of palisade interior to it here. Maybe another enclosure here. And then here we have a large curvilinear ditch and another one here that seem like they might be um, outer enclosures on the southern side of the rock, as well as this later feature that looks like some sort of, of, of avenue um, and these linear features that maybe are dividing up space between those, th those two enclosing features. So initially I'd hoped that these might be, um, that these, these, these enclosures on the southern side might turn out to be early medieval and some of them might yet, um, but it's, it's proved quite difficult to, to, to try and find any early medieval archaeology at Cashel, despite its importance and significance. So in July, we opened up a trench on, across um, the, the feature that we see here on the, the left. And lo and behold, 
we got loads and loads of animal bone and 12th and 13th century artifacts. <laughs> um, there might be some very, very um, uh, optimistic uh, evidence of a, of a recut that the artifacts, art, art, artifactual evidence including the 13th century pottery comes from with some animal bone that we got from below that recut. So we might yet find an early medieval date for that, but I wouldn't hold out much hope. So again, that kind of puts, puts uh, some difficulty in trying to, trying to clarify the nature of activity at Cashel the nature of that early phase, but hopefully further work over the next couple of years will, will help to help to address it. So the big problem that Cashel faces is not just that the rock itself, but in the wider landscape issues of date. There's been very little excavation, very little study of the landscape around it, so anything needs to be taken with a pinch of salt that I might say in the next, next few minutes. What we do have though is a whole series of very, very large enclosures on the southern southern side of Cashel that maybe are defending it from that polity that I talked about earlier that seem to be based to the south and then the southwest of Munster. So we can see one here, one here, and one here. Large bivalent or sorry, trivalent and quadrivalent enclosures on hilltops to the south that seem to demarcate in a very impressive fashion um, a major royal, royal place. Those enclosures, to my mind, the scale of them suggests that they're amongst a very early group of multi valid enclosures in Ireland, maybe fifth or sixth centuries. But again, that's that's to be to be verified by by excavation. Then we have lots and lots of ring forts, which are that kind of classic early medieval settlement type. In actual fact, there's one of the largest concentrations of ring forts within the landscape around Cashel. There's a huge amount of them that are early medieval settlement enclosures. And we know from recent work that these are likely to have been constructed in the period 600 to 850. The scale of them and the, 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 the number of them makes it quite, quite interesting to think about why there's so many of them within this landscape. And one of the kind of tentative suggestions that I would make is that they actually seem to cluster around those earlier larger enclosures that suggest that maybe they formed the foci of settlement, settlement clusters. And that that per is perhaps a manifestation of the, the role of a royal place um, and the, the, the kind of materialization of a, of a royal court. Partly that's because some of the place names around Cashel seem to contain um, the names of lineages that are based around Munster or polities around the, the south of Ireland that uh, were controlled by the kings of Cashel and controlled by the kings of Munster. So Rat McCartig for the Muscariga, Balia Juic, these are a lineage of the Kirkaligta, and the Iliaton or the Line. And then some of the place names of these large settlement enclosures seem to imply some level of hierarchy, so dignity, honour in the place names although Nick might have, have different, different, different ideas there. So possibly this is actually the, the, the kind of the, the gifting of places within the royal domain, within the royal landscape to retain our kings or, or subject kings within the, 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 the control of these, of these people. Burial evidence, very, very slight. There is two single burials from the entirety of the road scheme around Cashel, and there's very few barrows from the, the, the royal domain itself. There is, however, about four burial, likely burial monuments on the western and northwestern faces of the, the rock itself. So there might be a funerary element, but there's no necessary implication to that as any, as any prehistoric element. There is a relatively good argument that can be made for inauguration, and Cashel is actually only one of two sites that we have concrete evidence for, the, for complex inauguration rituals, Cashel and Tara, in the entirety of Ireland. There's a lot of evidence for inauguration, but it actually comes from a late medieval context. Possibly that ritual is, is centred on this avenue and the Dove Cloy, which is a long sunken linear avenue that winds its way from the northeast towards the rock and along its northeastern north northern face. So we can see it here with two big turns and then it expands and peters out here on the northwestern face. Where it starts, we have a low platform mound that you can see here. So as you approach Cashel from the northeast, this is the first time you can actually see the rock of Cashel itself, which is this kind of looks like an extension to the ridge, but it's actually a freestanding outcrop. I did some geophysics a good number of years ago to show that this does actually extend along the northern face. And there's a little kink that seems to be purposefully just to, to, to incorporate one of those four barrows that are on the western and northwestern faces. And then only a few hundred meters away from this, in an, beside another barrow, is this beautiful sixth century penannular brooch that came from a little pit stuck into the top of the the Barrow Monument. On the top of the rock itself, an inauguration ritual probably culminated, and um, we have texts that refer to that inaugura refer to inauguration furniture and likely give the, the dicta used in the inauguration of a, of a king. And we also have a reference to a church, which is a royal church, possibly the first royal church built at any of the major royal sites in Ireland. And this has been excavated in the early 1990s by, by Brian Hodgkinson. 
It probably dates to the reign of Fadelmin McCriven in the, the first half, well, second quarter of the, the, the ninth century. And he actually held ecclesiastical office at Derry Flan, where the Derry Flan chalice that you see here is, um, is just to the, a few miles to the northeast of, of Cashel. So possibly actually, actually that comes from that sort of period of, of patronage. The church itself seems to suggest some sort of ecclesiastically orientated recomposition of the summit of the rock in the start of the, the ninth century, and possibly a more vocally ecclesiastical or Christian office of kingship developing at that point, because we also have a, a cross fragment that is also ninth century AD in date from the summit of the rock, although it was found in early 20th century rubble again. Um, in terms of what we know about the rest of the rock, we know there's some burial from probably around about the 9th century associated with the church. Here's some of these early burials excavated outside Cormac's Chapel. And um, an excavation by Con Manning in, um, uncovered a wall about two metres um, wide that predates the 15th century, but we've no other concrete evidence for it otherwise. But it looks possibly like it might actually be an early wall, possibly around the, 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 the summit of the, the knoll. In geophysics on the summit, we found um, a circular feature here that looks like it's um, a, a robbed out cairn with a, um, a stone feature at the centre of it that might be a kist, possibly related or in some way to a reference in a late 7th century text to an early king of Cashel that says he was buried mm -hmm. facing north um, a, a, under the couch of the king's foimdiri at, at Cashel. So possibly that's explaining why it's in the northeastern corner, but also with a north-south orientated cyst. And then the final stage of inauguration seems to have been at this site about two kilometres to the southwest of the rock at um, uh, Rona Irlin, which is almost certainly ba uh, ba Balin Balinari, the place of a king, um, this lovely quadrivalent fort that you see down here. Immediately to the north of this is a complex here at Raccoon, where we have the, the largest baroque cemetery in the entire landscape, a whole five barrows that are about four metres in diameter each, they're tiny. Um, contained within a small rectangular enclosure and there's a possibility of a crop mark here that might be in some way connected to. But this is a site at which um, kings of Cashel were proclaimed by, the, by the, the, the people who performed the inauguration ceremony. And the people who proclaimed the king, they seem to have controlled the territory that immediately started right here. So they actually owned this land immediately below Balnri. And this is the site that um, in an origin myth for Cashel, um, Cashel is revealed to the swine herds of the King of Munster, probably in this area here. So they return to this site at the end of an inauguration ritual um, and they, they get proclaimed, they get their genealogy recited, and then they get um, instructed in this fashion with this passage at the end here. Arise and proceed in safety, journey in safety, your royal power is more right than a druid, surpassing a testament, surpassing a fire and death. And Dennis Casey has actually suggested that this is um, the final stage of Telak, which was a legal sacrament for taking possession of land that involved a whole series of rituals, but the final one of which was circumambulation, perhaps in this case of um, the royal domain itself or of the royal estates that the king took upon inauguration. Um, so Cashel is a really problematic site. It's one that is probably the most significant site, if not the second most significant site after Tara in Ireland, but one that's poorly served in terms of our archaeological knowledge of it. And hopefully that will develop over the next uh, couple of years as we get farther into the project. These are some people who've helped along the way and given access to land um, and uh, been really, really helpful. So I'll leave it at that and I shall pass over to Russell.